Well, welcome, welcome. Hello, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Whether you're joining us here live or you're watching the replay, welcome to the Green Wheels Expo webinar series. My name is Daphne Dixon and I am one of 15 members of Sustainable Fairfield. We are so excited that we have our, our um, Green Wheels Expo. It's been going on, for, going on for seven days. It started on Saturday with an amazing interview with Carbeth J. Leno. And it's, um, if you still wanna see that interview, it's on our website, sustainablefairfield.org. And then on Sunday, we partnered with the Electric Vehicle Car Club of Connecticut, the Electric Vehicle um, Club of Connecticut. And we had this amazing car parade from Westport to Fairfield. It, it, um, we, we started it off with um, flags waving by first selectman, um, Murphy of, of Westport, and um, the parade was led by Westport's EV police car. So that was pretty incredible. And then we, we landed there in Fairfield with select woman uh, Nancy Lefkowitz um, waving us all in. So it was, it was an amazing car parade. We had about 30 EV, EVs on the road, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And now on Monday, we have um, we have an electric um, vehicle showcase on our website, Sustainable, Sustainable Fairfield. Our, our task force members put that together. So if you want to see what electric vehicles are available to purchase in Connecticut, you can go to our website and you can check out our virtual EV showcase. So thank you to all the volunteers who put a lot of hard work into putting that together. Thank you so much. Now, Monday through Friday, we have our Green Wheels webinar series. We started off yesterday, um, and the topic was, how is Connecticut going to reach 125,000 EVs by 2025? So we were so lucky um, to have Tr Tracy Babbage from Connecticut Deep talk about the, the MOU that really has um, set the stage and the ZEV Alliance Agreement um, that is, is really the background of why we, why we need to get to 125,000 vehicles by 2025. We also talked about, she also talked about air quality. Um, then we were lucky to have Anthony Chirolis of the Cheaper Program. He's on that board, and he was talking about the incentives that the Cheaper Program has. And then um, we we ended up the the um, the, the webinar with with um, uh, Josh Kirstenbaum of uh, Maritime Chevy, and they will have 30 EVs ready to sell. And um, they are so excited to help Fairfield reach its individual town goal of 2,175 EVs by 2025. And so we were so, it was great to have them all. Then Wednesday, our webinar series continues on with how business can, businesses can go electric. Thursday, we have a, a really great um, uh, fleet tool, fleet analysis tool that we'll be sharing with municipalities. And Friday, we have a site visit at White Plains School District where we are going to get behind the scenes of what it's like to have an electric school bus. So we're really excited for the rest of, rest of, the, rest of the webinars coming up this week. But today we are so lucky to have Doug Holcomb, CEO of Greater Bridgeport Transit, to talk about the absolutely incredible Proterra electric transit buses. We are so thankful and grateful to have Doug here with us today to share this incredible story. And um, before we, we bring Doug onto the stage, I'd just like to introduce Lee Granis. He's coordinator of Greater New Haven Clean Cities Coalition. And Lee, he's gonna provide us with some background on Proterra. So take it away, Lee. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, can you, everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, good. Uh, Proterra was started here in Connecticut, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, it, uh, the Greater New Haven Clean Cities, the City of New Haven, and the Greater New Haven Transit District, uh, after having a successful stint with electric trolleys, we actually had electric trolleys running here in New Haven back uh, at the beginning of uh, the century, the two, around 2001 we started. And they were very successful, ran for about seven years. Unfortunately, the battery technology was not keeping up, and so the batteries uh, cost uh, cost a lot of money, and they were uh, just not really replaceable at the time. And we really needed to upgrade it to lithium technology, and uh, that just didn't happen. So 
the thing that came out of that was <clears throat> to get money, funding to look at a, a hydrogen powered bus. And the first Proterra bus was actually a battery dominant uh, fuel cell uh, bus. And uh, it got its big start after we got the initial funding from the Federal Transit Administration's fuel cell bus program. Uh, initially, it was a plug and play bus. Basically, we could take out the fuel cell and put in a uh, biodiesel CNG or propane uh, fueling system to run the bus because at that time the battery technology was uh, lithium was just coming on board and uh, it, the range was a big issue. So to get the extra range, we care we will put an APU or an auxiliary power unit on board to, to get it going. So. My coalition, the City of New Haven and Transit District all got together <clears throat> and we formed a team and it was called Origin One. And we contracted with Mobile Energy Solutions, MES, out of Colorado because uh, they seem to have the technology and the wherewithal to go forward. The first bus <clears throat> con concept was to be a lightweight bus built from the ground up. We weren't taking diesel uh, buses and putting fuel cells or batteries in them because there was all that extra weight we didn't need. So the, the concept was to, to at least get 10,000 pounds off of a 35 foot bus. And the 35 foot bus was the initial bus targeted size wise. It was, and in order to do that, we went to a sailboat company uh, in to, uh, to make the initial body for the bus. And it was made with, they look like bathtubs and they were fused together in the center and we initially wanted to make them in Colorado where MES ended up uh, settling. But to, to do that carbon fiber type body at, at uh, 6,000 or 5 to 6,000 feet, you in, would in, uh, come up with 20% more weight onto the vehicle. So we went to a sailboat company in Rhode Island, and they actually were the ones who built, who built the initial uh, bodies, and they're still building the, the bodies for it. And uh, the... The batteries that were used initially were lithium titanate. Lithium titanate is a little bit heavier than your regular lithium batteries, but they are very robust and uh, they can take a lot of charge and discharges. And at that time, the titanate was actually coming out of a, a U.S. mine, so we really liked that part. And then we put two small fuel cells on it, made by Hydrogenics, two 12W, 12 kW fuel cells. And later on in the development, uh, the MES people put a transmission into the bus because we needed to have a high speed dash capability without depleting the batteries if you got off on an interstate highway. And to this day, this, these buses have transmissions in them. Um, so <clears throat> the, the initial money that we got here in Connecticut for it was three earmarks, which we did a technical change and it ended up being $3.5 million. Rosa Delora, our Congressman Congresswoman here in this area was instrumental in getting all this done for it, plus uh, Senator Dodd and Senator Lieberman. And uh, that, got, that got the ABS started with their contract. They are the building that they put up in, in uh, Golden, Colorado at the Coors Industrial Park, near where they make Coors. Uh, and that's where the bus uh, came into being. And the first bus uh, hit the road. I mean, it was being built in, I think, around 2006. And uh, then uh, the fuel cell bus program was funding that initial bus and uh, it, it got out, hit the road and uh, that was $16 million worth of additional funding that was gained through, the, f through what we started here in Connecticut. And so the, <clears throat> the, that was the, actually the beginning. In the middle of the process, MES, uh, got a board and they didn't like the word mess for a company name, MES, uh, Mobile Energy Solutions. So at that time, it's around 2006, as I remember, the name of the company was changed to Proterra. It's the name that's currently in, in, in being. And then as the success of the bus built up, quite a few investors started jumping on the bandwagon to include General Motors and some others. And, uh, the, the buses have, have moved on and they went from a 35 foot bus to a 40 foot bus and uh, to two uh, manufacturing facilities, one in South Carolina, one in uh, Los Angeles and two types of charging and overhead charging system that can put 500 kW in, in five minutes into the bus uh, for, uh, 
for short routes or uh, the new, newer buses, which have battery packs on them that get them well over 200 miles. And Doug is going to talk all about that. Uh, so just want you to know this, this bus started here. Unfortunately, we didn't have the wherewithal to get it manufactured here for lots of reasons you can probably figure out. But uh, uh, that's about it. So I'll, I'm around if somebody has questions. There you go, Daphne. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. So I'm sure that was a, a lot of information that is new to, to, to a lot of us. So um, it's an incredible history. So we appreciate you sharing that with us. And, um, and now we're going to turn the stage over to Doug Holcomb, CEO of Greater Bridgeport Transit, to tell us about the exciting news that's going on in Bridgeport and the unveiling of these Potera buses in Bridgeport. Thank you so much, Doug, for joining us today. Okay, thank you. And I, you know, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to try to share my screen right now uh, with everybody, and I hope uh, it works. I hope you can see that. All right. It looks great. Yeah. All right. Is that you? Is that you can see that enough? Oh, yep. Just... Yep. Right. So. <clears throat> I've been working with Proterra for more than two years now, and I did not know that history. So thank you, thank you for that. I'm going to give you an overview of a zero emission bus program that was, is actually a partnership between the DOT and GBT and a number of other agencies. And um, <clears throat> these buses are already here in Bridgeport. That's a picture of one that that uh, we're testing that in front of Housatonic Community College. But let me. Uh, give you the background how we got into this and where, where we're going with the project. Um, and Doug, I think you might just want to hit. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Right. <clears throat> so um, just over the weekend, and I hope this isn't too corny for everybody, but just over the weekend, I learned of a record that was broken last Thursday. I was reading an article in the BBC and up until last Thursday, the record for getting more than 1 million uh, followers on an Instagram account was held by Jennifer Aniston and la like, no surprise, right? <clears throat> the last third, and she did it in five hours and 16 minutes. Oh, last Thursday, another account was started and shattered that record when uh, he got more than a million and 44 minutes. And that was David Attenborough. And this quote here is his inaugural quote. And I shared it with the group yesterday, but it's against this backdrop that that we are working on this project and then i'm a planner by trade i was uh, at the in the graduate curriculum at university of rhode island for community planning and we always talked about think global and act local and i didn't realize until doing a little homework over the weekend that that was given to us by a, like a, a town planner in uh, a scottish town planner in 1915 and, and he was like a, a town, a pioneer town planner and a biologist. So th against that backdrop that the rest of the work that we're doing is our local effort. And I won't read all of this to you, but I wanted to put, there's more words than I normally would put on this, but I thought if we're, if I'm going to share the presentation, it would make more sense to people who haven't been on the, you know, on this call or on this, on this. But, um, but this is two, the first of the two battery electric buses. It's really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, aimed at, uh, at at reducing our own emissions. Uh, for a long time, transit agencies have claimed the benefits, environmental benefits of public transit. Those are mostly derived from the riders who uh, who choose to take the bus. They're not driving alone, and therefore there's a savings there. But now, transit agencies, as Lee pointed out, uh, around the world are looking for ways to change their operation to make them more efficient. We think this project will do it and in the long run will save money for us. So it's a brand new thing for us. And I will not lie to you. There was a couple times over the last 18 months where I put my head in my hands and I thought, why did we do this? But you know, over the last couple of days with the delivery of them and we really learned about it, um, it's been very exciting. One of the things that uh, people, many people don't know probably unless you're in the transit industry is what the expectations are of a transit fleet. Um, when you use federal money to buy a bus, it, you can't replace that bus with more federal money for at least 12 years. So we're looking for something that's going to last a long, long time. And that helps to put some perspective on the costs of these things. They need to be in continuous operation. If a bus goes out of service for more than 90 days, FTA wants to know about it. So you can't be working with a fleet that always has buses that are down for a long period of time. You only are allowed to have a 20% spare ratio. That means that if you are, you know, you can only have 20% um, 
of the buses that you normally have in your peak pullout set aside for maintenance. So you don't, you can't double the size of your fleet in case you have some kind of problem that you have to campaign. Um, we need them to service at night. We wanted them to be serviced when the rest of our service crews were there. And a, a solid traditional city diesel bus can be out there 16 hours a day with multiple drivers on it. And um, buses are assigned to what's called blocks. And then drivers are assigned to their own pieces of work within those blocks. So when I talk about blocks later, you'll, you'll, you'll know what, I'm, what I mean there. And then they're subject to Buy America requirements. So now those are at least 70% of the um, components made in the United States and final assembly in the United States. So that's a pretty tall order and I suspect limits the number of vendors that you can, you can have. And then they have to be what in the industry is called Altoona tested, meaning uh, there's a Penn State facility in Altoona, Pennsylvania, and, and the buses have to pass testing there before they're eligible to, to be purchased using federal money. Uh, very quickly, the, the project overview, the first phase is two Proterra Catalyst 440 kilowatt battery packs and two Proterra 125 kilowatt chargers. And there were many chargers to choose from, but we ended up because, uh, you know, all things being equal, we wanted one vendor. And one of our project managers said, the benefit of that is you have one throat to grab when something goes wrong. And he meant it as a joke, but there is some truth to this because the only problems that we're experiencing now happen to be between the chargers and the buses. And since it's one company that helped us, you know, there, there's no finger pointing here. And then phase two um, is three more Proterra. I'm sorry, it's not a catalyst. It's uh, the, I should have put, it's actually called a, um, a ZX5, which is a zero emission extended range fifth generation Proterra bus. So a long way they've come from what Lee was, was mentioning. And then um, on some more 125 kilowatt chargers. And so we built the infrastructure out to accommodate up to 11. And, um, you know, interrupt me if you have a question. That's, I, don't, I don't have on my screen uh, the whole attendee list. So if someone's raising their hand, I can't see that. But, and again, you didn't have to read the entire slide, but I wanted you to know where the money came from. Uh, Federal Transit Administration has a lower no emissions grant program. We applied for the funding three times and we lost the first two and then one on the third one. And while it was unfortunate that we lost the first two, in hindsight, I'm glad we did because even in that short period of time between 2017 and late 2018 or 2016 and 2018, uh, the industry changed a lot and we are not looking at uh, in, route, in route charging. And then there's a regular formula funding. So we took money that was normally spent to replace uh, diesel buses and we reprogrammed it to, through FTA's cooperation to be able to be used in this program. And then the Connecticut DOT provides matching funding. It's very rare. In fact, I can't think of an instance where FTA gives funding and doesn't require a match with the exception of recent CARES money um, related to the pandemic. And right up front, so you know, these buses are more expensive by far than a diesel bus or even a hybrid electric bus. A diesel bus you could expect to spend 475 to 500,000. Um, a hybrid diesel electric, which we have 35 in our fleet, um, you can expect to spend north of 600 or six and a quarter. And uh, the base bus here, the uh, Catalyst E2, 440 is 770,000. And uh, with all the um, configurables, and by that I mean security systems, and this has an exterior turning uh, audio announcement. So if there's anybody in the street, it's, they can hear it say bus turning, brings a total cost per unit to 935,000. And then the charter is about 60,000 a piece. <clears throat> We're working, and I'll, I'll talk about the partners in a minute, but we're working with a company called CTE, Centers for Transportation and the Environment, a 501c3 not for profit in Atlanta, whose mission it is to uh, have vehicles like this deployed in the nation's fleets. And then there's a sizable amount of money <clears throat> uh, from, the, again, from the Federal Transit Administration and CONDOT, 207,000 happens to be in this budget for workforce development. As you can imagine, there's a lot of training to be done. Uh, for all of the drivers, all of the cleaning staff, um, and all of the mechanics. <coughs> and uh, the partners are Proterra, the manufacturer who we introduced us to, the 
Connecticut Department of Transportation and CT Transit. So one of the things that was great about this is, and CONDOT wasn't just providing funding, but helped with project management, a lot of rate analysis, working with Pura and the utilities. We had a really good team. And I think the benefit of that was, besides the project getting implemented, was that everybody went to school on this. And so there are now people at CONDOT, Connecticut Transit, and other agencies that know how this works, at least how this project worked. And then we had an architect on board for ongoing facility work that we were doing. They happened to have uh, experts in rate analysis. And so they helped us, and I'll explain later, we had to replace all of our switch gear. They helped us with charging infrastructure. And right now, in fact, I just issued a PO for about $117,000 worth of design work for supplemental fire suppression, new systems for fire suppression, um, heavier, um, heavier um, sprinkler systems, heat sensors, things like that, uh, fans. So uh, we're, we're working with them on that and they did a little piece of research on that for us. So we're entirely up to code, but uh, the codes I don't think really anticipated these kinds of vehicles. And then um, Center for Transportation and the Environment and these folks have been really key, helping us with every aspect of the project, specification development, route modeling, rate modeling, all of that. And they'll be with us for another uh, year and a half in the post-deployment period measuring and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so we did, um, just so you know that, and this is how we tried to understand before we pulled the trigger and bought these buses, was how was this, and, and, and the technology was even evolving as we were doing this and probably in the December of, of 20, very late in 2018, we did, we looked at modeling the routes. What would the energy use be and what routes would we operate on and what would the impact of a diesel fire heater on board uh, be in, in terms of the range? And that's probably a surprise, but I'll explain why. Um, so we looked at four different configurations. One was the 440 and then they have a pro drive, which is a single drive and a duo drive, which is a motor for each of the, of the rear wheels. And then we looked at our routes and it, we selected the routes by the type. So we wanted high frequency city bus, we wanted to inter-regional bus and we wanted express bus. We didn't select it by the block, which was a mistake, at least in hindsight. And we found in doing that analysis that the vehicle didn't have the range we were looking for. And here's where, like, like the Indiana case, you know, we knew it up front. We still proceeded but um, we then did a second round, a second iteration of the route modeling. And we looked specifically at the 40 foot because we were kind of waffling between 35 and 40 foot. We picked, um, we re reselected some routes that had shorter blocks where we wouldn't have to change off the bus. And we still found that it's not entirely comparable to a diesel. And I think that's true today. And um, so at that point, we split the project. We said, why are we gonna buy 440 kilowatt battery packs on all five buses when we know just around the corner is a 660. So there was a lot of homework that went into it. And this is the kind of thing that came out of it. This is just one table and I won't bore you with all of this, but along the, along the left side here is the block number, which is a bus assignment, the regular route, you know, rider would know as route 10, the distance and the duration. And then we looked at it with, uh, with the electric heat generated by the bus itself and then auxiliary heat shouldn't really make that much of a difference in the range. And it showed us where we could deploy them and where we couldn't. And this happens to be the results with a new battery. We did it with an old battery, midlife and older batteries. And you start to see a few more red checks come out of it. So that's how we decided that we were gonna proceed with two, but not with the, uh, not with the entire five, not quite yet. And then we developed the specification. So it was a 40 foot, 40 passenger plus 14, standees, the 440, it would be charged in the depot, and we had some concerns, and among those were the weight. You would think that since these kinds of uh, composite materials are used in wind turbines and in um, maritime applications and in aircraft, they would be light, but they're, they're, these buses are as heavy as a, as a proper city bus, and it has what's called a monocoque body, like a shell, so the whole structure is in its skin. Um, there are no panels like in other city buses. And that was another thing that scared our maintenance folks. But I don't, uh, we were visiting another transit agency in Clemson, South Carolina, and the, that one of their Proterra bus was struck, they said about 45 miles an hour, uh, and it scuffed the side really is all it did. So I think our crew down there felt a little bit better about that. But, you know, we hear things about, it's just a whole new animal about how that body will work. 
And then, okay, so I won't spend a lot of time in here, but we also added uh, an, an automatic passenger counters and a, and a vehicle location system. We have a 12 camera security system, the ProTran pedestrian protection that I mentioned earlier. These have driver barriers to protect them from assaults. Up until uh, we did this project, we already had had 70% of the buses equipped with the barriers to prevent assaults. We had a couple, and uh, but now they are a uh, hot commodity because uh, drivers see them as a shield uh, during the pandemic. And there are USB charging ports for people at seats, which we wanted to make sure we give we gave the riders everything that they had on the other buses. A little bit about the Proterra zero tailpipe emissions. We expect lower operating costs, and I'll give you some details of that. They're quiet. During the whole press conference, they were running, and nobody really knew it yesterday. So we told them towards the end that the buses were running. They were quite surprised by that. I mentioned the kind of uh, bus body that it has. And I think, you know, we can arrange an in-person an in, an in visit if, you, if, uh, if Daphne and the others would like to arrange something like that. I mean, we had probably 40 people in the garage yesterday. It's most people I've been around in, in, in quite a while. Um, it's designed uh, to keep the batteries in separate compartments underneath the floor, not on the roof of the bus, which some of the other manufacturers have, but I'm, my understanding is the 660 will have batteries on the roof of the bus. The range is something that is, uh, this is a moving target. We're hoping for something around 150 miles between charges for the 440 and something north of 200 for the 660. But that's what this is about. And that's why it kind of looks like baby steps where we, um, you know, we want to see how these work before we pull the trigger on, on the rest of them. And that's why there's no real, not that we're not committed, but we haven't made any public grand announcements about when we'll be all electric because the electric grid, the charging infrastructure, the evolving technology, and, and, the, and, and how these buses are received by the riders, the drivers appear to like them. But we also insisted on standardized charging. And so the charging infrastructure that's in our facility with only modest modifications can be applied to any of the manufacturers of these uh, that are out there. That's what a dispenser looks like. That's only a small part of the charger. So that's the, that's the side of our uh, maintenance facility where the dispensers are hung. And then there's a perforation now in the wall that goes out to the chargers, which I have another picture of. So uh, let's see, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, it's a, like I said, a 440 kilowatt hour battery pack, then the 660s, uh, something like 2.2 kilowatt hours per mile. And we had a choice between 60 kilowatt and 125 kilowatt chargers. That's, um, we went with the 125s and uh, these buses charge in about three and a half hours. And the, for the modeling, our assumption was the economy for um, diesel fuel buses was four miles per gallon. That's a little bit higher than, uh, than the older diesels, but when you mix into the fleet, the hybrids, it, that bumps up. And then the five-year diesel cost uh, for the modeling was 272. Already the model is blown up because uh, as you know, uh, fuel prices have come way down and we just purchased diesel fuel at $1.63 for a year. So um, we buy it for a, a bid for a year in advance. And so some of the numbers I'll show you, we converted to ranges. And if you ask me the question, will the additional capital cost be covered by the savings? I will then ask you, if you can tell me what the cost of diesel fuel will be for the next 12 years, I can answer that question. So I don't, I don't really know that. Um, and we looked at simultaneous charging versus staggered charging. Um, staggered charging means one or two at a time, that kind of thing. And it's easy to do when your fleet is only two or five buses in the period that you have to charge. Simultaneous charging can be more expensive, um, but as the fleet expands and you start to have 11 or 20 or 100, um, and as some agencies are getting, you have to look at a different charging strategy. So that's a, um, that's a consideration here. And so if you look at the annual cost from our model using those assumptions, um, the red is the 100, it's supposed to be 125 kilowatt. There's some confusion there, but that's an image that they sent me and I can't change the, the number. So uh, you can see the savings from um, the two buses, and then it grows for five and 11 buses. It could be substantial, but you know, this is different now because of the, um, of the low, low cost of diesel fuel, but you know, that can change very quickly. 
And this, this was the staggered charge scenario. We also did this for uh, simultaneous charging. And just so you know, in one of the earlier slides, I was telling you that these things are need to be serviced um, during the time that all the other buses are being serviced. We don't have a separate crew to do this during the day. We don't want to draw demand charges during the day. So you can see we have from week, the rates in Connecticut happen to currently be the same for shoulder and off peak. So we have essentially from um, when you look at the midnight to noon, we've got midnight to 10 out of that that we can charge. And then when you look at noon, um, 12 to midnight, we have on, only a portion of that, right? Um, so, uh, you know, so, um, and on the weekends, it's off peak. So, um, but that doesn't particularly help us because we need to charge every night. And a little bit about the facility. During the time that we were getting ready for the project, we were having a separate assessment done of this facility. It was built in 1987. And one of the outcomes in the middle of the specification development for the charging infrastructure and for the buses, one of the outcomes was the switch gear is old and needs to be replaced. So that was, we suspected at the time, around a $700,000 project. And, and we were really fortunate because Condot understood that. And uh, Condot, it, within, I would say two weeks, the regional planning agency and the MPO and Condot moved that money for us. And we had, our, we had the architects design that. And when they designed the replacement of the switch gear, they ran the conduit over to, uh, over to where the charters are. So this is the back of our building, which actually fronts the Metro North right away. And the travel lane you see there is a fire lane. And these are the first two chargers themselves. So if you perforate that wall on the other side is where the dispenser is. And if you can envision looking down this picture down the road, 11 of these all along, the, all along that side of the, of the facility. Um, well, an important part of this is workforce development. It's certainly changing what our maintenance folks need to do. I, someone was asking me, would we need fewer maintenance people? I, I don't think that that will happen. I don't envision that at all. And that certainly wasn't one of the goals for this, but there's a lot of training, a lot of training working in high voltage environments and learning a new product. But people seem pretty excited about it now. They seem to be, they seem to be kind of, um, yeah, kind of psyched about learning a, a, a new equipment and, and, and are looking forward to us getting more. And that's true of the drivers, but this just gives an overview of the kind of training that we're, we, we bought. Now, one of the delays in putting these in service for the public is because all of the trainers are from South Carolina, from where Par uh, Proterra is in Greenville. And to come here under travel restrictions, they've got to quarantine for 14 days before they do anything. So we've done enough training remotely to get in the mechanics and some of the drivers uh, ready to use them so that we can test them and make sure they're commissioned properly. But not all the drivers have been changed, trained yet and all the mechanics and they all will be trained. So this is, these buses aren't gonna be assigned to just one route with a handful of trainers. Everybody gets trained and the buses get deployed throughout the region. So um, that's an important part of this. That budget is about 207,000. And here's some of the impacts. And I don't have a lot of experience in this and relied heavily on CTE, but I asked them to put a range together on this. And you know, they explained to me a little bit about the difference between uh, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, and some of the ground level pollutants. But what you see here is the miles for the two, for the two buses, the miles that they travel in a typical year, how much we reduce our diesel consumption. So the first phase is by almost 25,000 gallons. And that is uh, reduced emissions of, of almost 500,000 pounds. That is an adjusted figure after you take into account the emissions uh, generated at the plant in Connecticut. And uh, Lee probably knows, uh, and more people on the phone probably know better than I do, but uh, I think some 60% of the energy in Connecticut is nuclear, followed by natural gas and then, and then uh, dirtier, uh, emissions. So, uh, and then those numbers are adjusted upwards when you get to five buses and 11 buses. Now, th if you look at this later and say this math doesn't really work, because, the, you know, if you divide the 85 264 by two and then multiply it by five, it comes out to less than 276. But the five buses and then to 11 start to assume the 660, and the 660 will travel more miles between charges and therefore the mileage is higher and the gallons uh, re uh, 
reduced by is also uh, is also higher. So that, that I think that's pretty beneficial. And then these are this is a slide that CTE put together for me. When you have uh, 24,000 gallons, eight pounds of volatile organic compounds, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter. And uh, I don't really have a good feel for how much that is, but it is a reduction. And this puts it into perspective. Uh, so the 559 on the left, that's actually not the net number, but you're looking at 5,000, 6,000 trees or 298 acres of seedlings planted and grown to 10 years. So I, I think that's a pretty good impact for the beginning and it compounds as we get out there. And then, you know, uh, this is the energy cost savings. When you compare the cost of diesel fuel to, um, to the energy that we anticipate, our first modeling I showed you earlier was somewhere around $22,000 per year savings. And that's for the first two buses. This is for the two buses. But now we had to recalculate because diesel is much, much cheaper. But it's also true that the five-year high would have put it much, much higher. There was a time when we were paying almost $4. So um, it's a double-edged sword for us. Uh, when, you know, when the cost of fuel goes down, that's a great savings. But when the cost of fuel goes down, it's almost always followed by um, a similar curve in ridership believe it or not. So uh, when, when the cost to operate a single occupancy vehicle is down, so too is ridership. So we watched our ridership drop from the peak in June of 2014 until this March when we were having a great, great year um, until the pandemic hit. And so where are we now? In the, in the past, we've had, you know, I've had to explain where, you know, this is what we're doing, but the switch gear is replaced, the modeling's complete, specs are done, charging infrastructure is all done. The buses are completed and delivered. The salespeople are after us to get the next three and the commissioning and testing underway. And I expect to put them in what we call revenue service, um, which is an industry term for when they're open for the public to use. And uh, that picture is from yesterday when we were fortunate to have the governor. We had Garrett Ucolito, who's a deputy commissioner of DOT, a woman um, who I just met yesterday morning named Katie Hackett, who's a deputy commissioner for energy at DEEP, and also Shante Hanks, who's a deputy commissioner for housing authority, who I was very happy to see there because um, of the importance of the buses in our neighborhoods, in our communities as a matter of, uh, you know, social justice. So um, I think we're, we're, doing, we're, we're doing well with this project so far. It really feels like it's taking off to me now. And so post-deployment, we're using, to, to monitor these, we're using a system called Vericity. And Vericity tracks the buses. This, I did this screenshot about a half an hour before we um, did this presentation. And those are the two buses and their state of charge in the facility right now. So if they were to start moving those, I, you know, I, I'd be able to track that. And we're gonna, we're gonna port this out through the website, some elements of this, so people will be able to see. And there's an, a statistical analysis part of it that based on programmed assumptions in the software will tell people the cumulative em, uh, emissions reductions over the life of the vehicle. So we want to be pretty uh, open about this and transparent about this if they're not working the way we want them to work. This also tells us the percentage of energy that's generated by the regenerative braking, which informs the training of the operators, right? So we want to maximize that. And so that I hope that wasn't too fast, but that is the, an overview of where we are. And I think the buses are beautiful. That um, the graphics package was done by a, cus a company called O'Donnell Design in New Haven. And, um, and I'd be happy to, I hope that helps and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has about that. I'm sorry we didn't do a virtual one, but I think well, watching me walk around the yard, um, the garage might not have been as informative. Um, so, so thank you well, very much. That was awesome, Doug. And, um, you know, I think we would like to take you up on your offer, though, of, of at some point doing, you know, as long as it's safe and, and we, we social distance and wear our masks. Um, I think we would like to take you up on your offer. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Having a, a virtual site visit. I think a lot of people would really enjoy that. So hopefully we can set that up before it gets too cold and, and uh, give people a chance to. They uh, still have to work in the cold. Yes, that's true. Um, I just, I have a quick question. So, um, you know, I know that there's, I understand there's a, a pilot going on in um, 
in Hampton and Stanford for another 12 electric transit buses. Um, and then of course there's this amazing work that you're doing. How do you think other transit agencies can start getting involved in these projects so that we can reach, reach our goal of 30% medium and heavy duty bus and truck electrification by 2030? Well, I think, I think that's already underway. And, and, and here's one of the beauty, um, the, this is the beauty of the project. The, the team that we had, had uh, Rick Hanley from Conda, Phil Scarazzo from Conda, uh, and two of the senior, uh, the leadership people in Connecticut Transit Maintenance, Dan Fiorello and Jacinto Torres, who oversee the Hamden garage, right? And so um, we all work together on the specs, the charging infrastructure. They're working with Wendell Architects, who is our architect on this. And so that was the idea here where, when I, what I didn't tell you was when we first applied jointly for the grant, um, it was 12 buses. And the idea was one low no grant and we'd split the buses between either Fast Track or Hamden or Stanford and some in Bridgeport. But when FTA in late 2018 made the award, um, they scaled all of the projects back across the country in order to spread the money around to a lot of different transit properties. So ours got cut in half. I thought, that's it. They're going to do it somewhere else and not in Bridgeport. And before I even heard, I got mad. Like personally, I like myself, like, okay, we, you know, we'll have to just wait. And then in a couple of days, I got a call and they said they wanted to do it in Bridgeport. And my anger turned to, what do they know about this that I don't know? Why are they doing it down here? So it was, it's a good team and it still is a good team. And they were all at the, um, at the event yesterday. And I think that's how the, that's how the information is going to spread. And, and uh, I report to the transit districts regularly and I report to the director of transit and ride sharing, Dennis Zielinski. And um, he is very um, uh, enthusiastic about this, uh, this part of the future of public transportation. So it's a good group of people, very cooperative, very helpful, very knowledgeable, and everybody's knowledge on these matters has grown. You know, we know, I think the pitfalls now, we know um, what to look for. And there are some things that um, as, as successful, I think, as Proterra has been, the difference between Proterra and some of the other manufacturers is this, and there's probably other differences, but Pro Proterra is a electric propulsion system group building now a city bus. The other ones like New Flyer and Gillick, those are city bus companies putting in electric propulsion systems. And so there are some things about the Proterra bus that are befuddling to our maintenance people. Um, one of them that was just came back around over and over again was the need to take out the entire dashboard to fix a wiper motor. So there's little things like that. And we have some really good mechanics and one particular who spent, uh, who visited um, before the pandemic, who visited the site during the manufacture of the buses in the deep winter. Um, and he, I used to say, Scott, please send some pictures back so I can see. And always it was some little switch or some gadget. I was like, I need a picture of the, you know, I'm thinking marketing and sharing it with people, but he is in the nitty gritty of this. So he, he knows them in and out. Um, so I, I think that, I hope that answers the question, but that's, it, it is something that the, that the DOT is serious about. I can't speak for them, but that's everything I get from talking to them, uh, serious about it. And their support of us both financially and and technically, and even, you know, even in every aspect of it, with working with the DEP and with Cura and understanding the rates, because frankly, electric rates are something that, uh, they're somewhat of a mystery to me. Um, so, and, and they make me very nervous. So, um, but in, in any case, that, that's a good question. Do you think that, um, do you think ridership will go up as a result of these beautiful new electric buses? Uh, that's a good question too. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of technology out there and I, I can tell you this in the industry, you hear a lot about mobile applications and, and uh, mobile ticketing, those kinds of things. But what, and those may have a small impact on ridership, you know, the industry tells us, and maybe the conversion to a cleaner fleet will attract people, but really it's frequency that brings people to transit. If you, if you put a, a, a bus out there every hour, some people will use it. Um, if you put a bus out there every half hour, a lot more people will use it. You know, if, you, if you're doing just a couple trips in the morning to some suburban location and a couple afternoon, not many people will ever ride that. And their number one goal will be to make enough money to get a car and not do that. No one wants to be left somewhere. It's the frequency and reliability of the service. 
So I can't say that will increase ridership. Oh, I'd like to, but, um, and now we're, we're hope we're, we're hoping for a slow and steady increase in ridership be, and be hard to know what to attribute that to. Sure. But the, a lot of things are against us, the pandemic and the low cost of fuel. So even if, even if they said tomorrow, we have a, you know, we have a, we have a vaccine and we'll put it in the water supply and everybody's safe and this is over. The low cost of fuel will keep ridership low for a little bit. If you, if you ask me, I would say 18 yeah. months to two years before we see close to what we had before. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, sure. no there, well, there's a, I was going to say there's a danger in that. And one of the areas where we're doing advocacy is to remind the General Assembly, members of the General Assembly who will listen to this, that just because ridership is off doesn't mean we should be cutting service. Because before we started the pandemic, it was a very busy service, 31 trips per bus per hour. And we recovered a lot of the cost of operating the buses through the fare box. It's called the recovery ratio in transit. And we had among the highest, you know, in the Northeast at 31, 30, sometimes as high as 34%. And both of those things turned into an Achilles heel during the pandemic because we stopped collecting fares. And with that went 30% of our, of the operating funds that we have. And um, nobody wanted to be on a bus with more than 10 people. So the, the, we have, we've got kind of a needle to thread here with regrowing the ridership in time, safely with a whole bunch of new protocols in place. Yeah. Um, so, so Lee, this is, um, you know, from the, from the beginnings when you were talking about how, how Plutera started and then to hear, you know, what's going on now, in Bridgeport and, and everything that Doug has talked about. Um, would you like to share some comments? Yes, a uh, couple of things that uh, I just went and looked up the uh, fuel mix and I wanted to get that corrected. Uh, right now, Connecticut's at six, right as we're speaking now, 64% natural gas is generating the electricity, 26% is nuclear, 7% is renewable, and then there's less than 1% that's a mix of things like possibly oil and stuff. So uh, uh, we, there's a, a website you can go to that will tell you real time where your electricity is coming from. But just want people to know that natural gas is probably the predominant fuel. It runs anywhere from 55 to 65% all the time is the predominant uh, electricity fuel mix in the background. And uh, all, everybody knows about all the, the hubbub over the rates that were, that were related to the guarantee of the nuclear power plant staying in operation. So uh, that's, that's another piece of it. Secondly, uh, I wanted to talk about CTE. C Early on when we started this thing back in 2005, 2004, we brought CTE on board, Don Dan Rodebar, who is actually still the executive director down there. And he actually has been involved in uh, with us, with me and then Proterra and then with uh, Doug uh, ever since uh, Proterra came into to being. So He's very, uh, very familiar and he and his staff down there, they've done a lot of good work. And uh, the other person I wanted to talk about is Mike Sanders, who is uh, Dennis Zielinski's predecessor. And all during the time that I was doing this and flipping money around and stuff, we were working very closely with Connecticut DOT and Mike Sanders who ran transit for the state of Connecticut at that time. So, so we had Connecticut DOT involved all through the development of Proterra because we had to be very careful that we weren't siphoning off money that was meant for other projects within uh, Connecticut for transit. So it, it uh, and there was different pots of money at that time, uh, 5309, 5307, and, and they all got, they, they switched around, got different names. So it got very confusing along the way. That, that's all I- You know, I I, if I could follow up on that too, I, would, I wouldn't want to do this without CTE. To me, that'd be like doing brain surgery on yourself. It was a whole different thing and we had a lot to learn. And we worked with a guy named Steve Claremont and Kylie McCord, who's been our project manager. And I talk to him every day and he helps me uh, when I have panic attacks and things like that. And, uh, and then it, it, regarding Mike Sanders, uh, I stay in touch with Mike. Um, he was the director of transit and ride sharing. And uh, he, was, he worked on the very first application and he was one of the people at Condot that convinced Condot, I think, to pursue the low no grant, the discretionary money. And, uh, and, and, and I was happy to be a part of that. We have, we're talking about how we partner with that. 
uh, with you know what what the partnership would look like CTE and what's the other one CalStar or something like that right on the west coast right yeah, yeah yes. you know and yes. so we debated that in fact uh, and I and invited Mike to the um, to the event yesterday but it was a holiday and you couldn't make it yeah mm -hmm. so um, as always there's um, always questions about increase in fares so we have a question in chat um, about that if there will be any increased affairs maybe because of COVID or ridership being down or because of these buses is that something you're able to, to shine a little light on sure um, right now we're not charging any fare at all and next Sunday we go back to front door boarding and charging the fare but I don't envision any change in the fare in order to pay for this we think the operating cost will actually go down and the capital costs are paid through a federal grant and through state capital. So there's, there's two distinct pots of money. Now, I'm not one of those who say, well, it's federal money and it's capital money, so spend it and don't worry about the efficiency of it. We like to see how that, how that will pan out. Just because the federal money is available doesn't mean, you know, you, you, you have to use it wisely. So there's, we don't anticipate any, any, any increase in the fares. We haven't raised, I think, October 2010, last fare increase, wow. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, you know, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. I think we all are so in awe of what you and the team has done there in Bridgeport and to have electric transit buses on the road, especially in a year like this. I mean, it's some, it's some good news that um, we're all so excited to see and um, we're so proud of you and we're so excited to get on those buses and, 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 and ride them ourselves, so. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And I, you know, I, I didn't know all of what was going on in all of these, on, on all the organizations. And it's great to learn more about it because I came at it more as a transit guy, figuring mm -hmm. we, owe, we owe an explanation to our neighborhoods as to what propulsion system we're using. We can't just go down the road and say, we're not interested. We don't really know the other propulsion systems. We're just gonna run diesel. We, have, we owe it to explore. And so I think that's one of the, the best things about the job that I have is, you know, one day you're working on, uh, you know, a roof replacement. Next day, you're working on zero emission buses. Next day, service planning and economic development. It's, it's, it's great fun, really. Well, it's incredible and such leadership that you and, and, and everyone there is showing. So we can't, we can't thank you enough. And thank you, Lee, for that history lesson. It was incredible. Um, I do want to just also thank our Green Wheels Expo um, sponsors that, that are, have been with us. They're with us for the whole seven days. We couldn't have done all of these events um, without them. I'd like to thank Maritime Chevy, Techno, the Electric Vehicle Club of Connecticut, Mo Green, Sustain, Pure, Greater New Haven Clean Cities Coalition, Connecticut Southwestern Clean Cities Coalition, and Live Green. So um, just thank you all so much. We look forward to seeing um, everybody who can join us on the rest of our webinars this week. Tomorrow is about how can businesses go green. Thursday is a fantastic and a fleet analysis tool for municipalities. And Friday is our site visit at White Plains electric school buses. So thank you all so much for joining us. And especially thank you to Lee and Doug, our featured guests for that amazing um, presentation about the electric, tra electric transit buses in Bridgeport. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You so Thanks, Lee. Good to see everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.